USC, I'd like to welcome all of you to this two-day academic symposium. Uh, Tom, I'd uh, like to uh, especially thank you for a remarkable speech in which you were able to say something very insightful about the person who Ronald Reagan is, who he was as a leader, but also about the social, economic, political times that shaped him and in which he operated. Could we have one more round of applause for this remarkable speech? I'd like to uh, ask the other panelists to come up here, and while they're coming up here, I'm just going to make a few remarks uh, about this partnership between the Ronald Reagan uh, Foundation and the University of Southern California. Uh, it's been a great opportunity for uh, my school and the university to partner in uh, putting on the first event of the uh, Reagan uh, Centennial Celebration and to focus on an academic examination of President Reagan's life and legacy. And I especially want to thank John Highbush, uh, and I'd also like to thank uh, Stuart McLaurin, uh, two people that I've worked with in this partnership, and they are uh, enormously capable and have been great uh, colleagues, and it's wonderful to have such partners. Uh, I also want to uh, state that this has been a partnership also at USC. Uh, not only did my School of Policy uh, uh, play an important role in this, uh, but uh, the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism was a partner with us as well. And so I want to thank uh, Dean uh, Ernest Wilson uh, for his uh, uh, enthusiastic and his faculty for their enthusiastic uh, partnership uh, with us as well. And uh, thirdly, I'd like to thank uh, Director and Professor Dan Masmanian and the Bedrosian, uh, USC Bedrosian Center on Governance in the Public Enterprise. Uh, it's an important center in our school and at USC, and they were a third partner at USC. So it was a really good joint effort. Uh, I, as was mentioned, this is the first of three or four academic symposiums that will be taking place. Uh, ours started yesterday. We uh, had a panel in the afternoon that focused on uh, President Reagan's overall leadership, uh, followed by, I thought, a, sp a spectacular uh, keynote address by renowned historian, California historian Kevin Starr. Uh, I, I know some of you heard his speech. I'm sorry more of you didn't. Um, uh, he spoke on Reagan's California. It, it was a, a really an excellent, uh, excellent speech. And today we also uh, had uh, two more panels in which we focused on Reagan as the great communicator and uh, also focused on Reagan and his policy uh, leadership. And finally, before we get to the panel, I'd like to take a moment uh, to thank uh, and acknowledge Marion Scharfenberger and her family who have uh, so strongly supported this effort. Uh, Marion is the widow of former USC Board of Trustees Chair, uh, George Scharfenberger. And in addition, I'd like to thank John and Judith Bedrosian, who are here with us uh, tonight, uh, for their uh, uh, support of the Bedrosian Center and their leadership in this effort. So um, at this point, I'd like to introduce a great uh, colleague and friend, uh, Jeff Cowan. Uh, Jeff is the current president of the Annenberg Foundation Trust at Sunnylands. Jeff is also the director of the USC Center on Communication Leadership and Policy and the former dean of the Annenberg School of Communication uh, and Journalism. Uh, for more than 30 years, Jeff has been an important force in nearly every facet of communication. Uh, as a public interest lawyer, academic administrator, award-winning teacher, author, playwright, TV producer, and government official. During his career, he previously served as the director of Voice of America, received an Emmy as an executive producer of a TV movie, and authored a best-selling book, and played a key role in the development of national public radio. Uh, please join me in welcoming Jeffrey Cowan. Thank you. Thank you, Jack, and thank you to the people at the, uh, at the Reagan Library. This has been great fun putting this together, and I'm so proud of the uh, partnership we have and of this remarkable panel. I just want to say a couple of words setting up this, this next session, because it's about, 
biography and legacy. And you've often heard it said that journalism is the first draft of history. And we actually have some great journalists here. But you might wonder, what's the first draft of legacy? Well, it really is the work of historians and the work of biographers. But one thing about legacy is that it doesn't really end. There's a second and a third and a fourth draft of legacy because biography continues to be rewritten as new facts are discovered. You might have had a new fact from Tom Brokaw tonight about uh, what would have happened if Ronald Reagan had not given that speech in 1964. Uh, and also as the world and the country and historians take on new perspectives and new political views and so forth. So legacy is always being created. But the legacy of truly great men, like Ronald Reagan, is a legacy that is important to understand how it's framed. And one thing that's fascinating about Ronald Reagan's legacy is that to an important extent, it really was created in a way that wove him together with Tom Brokaw and with the other people on this panel. Because as many of you will remember, among his great speeches were actually two speeches that he gave commemorating the 40th anniversary of D-Day. And the speech of Ponta Hook, which actually was written by Peggy Noonan, who unfortunately couldn't be with us here, here tonight, but she wrote that speech. But other people on the panel were also involved. Uh, Doug Brinkley has written a wonderful book about this moment and talks about what a transitional moment it was. Tom Brokaw and Lou Cannon both covered that speech. And in, uh, in his book uh, about the, the Ponte Hook uh, uh, speech, Doug Brinkley argues that it also is what started us thinking about America as the greatest generation. Tom Brokaw, of course, has done such a great job of making that a part of the national consciousness of that period. But before D-Day, before that moment took place, those were private memories. And thanks to what Ronald Reagan did, thanks to what uh, Peggy Noonan wrote, and thanks to the work of the great journalists here, it's now become a part of our national consciousness and a part of our history. So history is important. Richard Reeves has written the, uh, one of the great biographies of Ronald Reagan one of the few historians to also write about several other great uh, presidents. And Pete Wilson was the only person to have served with Ronald Reagan as he was creating that governorship of California, where he was in the legislature, and then as the, in the US Senate as a senator as part of the presidential legacy. So please join me in thanking this wonderful group for participating and welcoming once again Tom Brokaw. Let me begin with Lou Cannon and with uh, Governor Wilson because they were present in a way at the creation of Ronald Reagan in power, in office in Sacramento. And I think any time that you look at the evolution of a public office holder, you must go back to the very beginning, the seminal moments. Lou, I remember that there was a great deal of skepticism about whether he would be up to the job of running a state as complicated as California against the likes of Jess Unruh and Willie Brown and George Moscone and, uh, and, and Bob Moretti and others who were the tigers on the Democratic side in the legislature. Do you remember uh, when you began to have a full appreciation of his ability to A, deal with them and B, steer the ship of state in the direction he wanted it to go? Yes, I do. I th Tom, like you, uh uh, I feel uh, fortunate that I just happened to be there when Ronald Reagan came along and somebody asked me to, my editor said, maybe you want to go here. Uh, he was giving a speech uh, in Sacramento. He called it out-of-town tryouts, by the way. He said it was an out-of-town tryout. And, uh, and that time, at that time, uh, Pat Brown was trying to get, his people were trying to get Reagan nominated uh, because th they thought that he'd be so easy easy to beat, and I came back and my editor asked me what I thought about it, and I said, I don't know, but I don't know why somebody would want to run against somebody who everybody seems to know and everybody seems to like. 
Well, I think Ronald Reagan did a great, Ronald Reagan was partly responsible, um, maybe largely responsible, for the underestimation of Ronald Reagan. It, of course, part of it was that he was an actor, and, an a, and, and a lot of people thought that uh, if you were an actor, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a synonym for being an airhead, which of course is not true. Uh, but when Ronald Reagan was asked what kind of a governor would you be, uh, he said, I don't know, I've never played a governor. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so you've got a guy who, the, Ronald Reagan's secret weapon in my view was that he was almost egoless. You know, he could tell all of these jokes about himself. You know, I nobody ever, no, no one ever died of hard work, he said, but I figured, why take a chance? Yeah. You know, and, and, and he could tell he's, and so people, people were tended to think of him. Well, he's this, you know, why, guy, he's smooth, he's glib. He's an actor, he's an empty head. And uh, uh, I think the first time that I had an appreciation of, of how smart this guy was, was about, uh, I, I can't remember when I exactly learned it, I think it was two weeks into his governorship, but he'd, I think he'd actually said it uh, a week into his governorship, is that Ronald Reagan had talked about coming in, we were gonna squeeze, cut, and trim. We were gonna, we were gonna uh, uh, make all these uh, cuts in the budget. But Pat Brown, uh, due to a little bit of uh, uh, trickery by his, you remember Hale Champion, his finance director, had made an accounting change so that Ronald Reagan, when he became, becomes governor, this is 1967, he actually has nine months of revenue for uh, to 12 months of, of, of state expenses. And Ronald Reagan is really, is really green, and he made a lot of mistakes in his first two, three months in office, but he knew right away, he said to an aide, he said, let's, let's raise the taxes necessary to, to govern while people remember who's responsible for it. And by that he meant Pat Brown. And Ronald Reagan in 1967 signed into law the largest tax increase in the history of any state up to then. It was a billion dollars, that's $6.2 billion in, in 2011 dollars. And, uh, uh, and Jess Unruh, who had helped, it wound up Jess Unruh, his, the big daddy, the speaker of the assembly, and Reagan wound up getting this thing through together, uh, uh, fighting the Senate. And I asked Jess about that afterward. Jess was really happy with the tax increase. It had a lot of things in it he wanted. And he said, well, he said, uh, uh, they'll remember that. They'll remember it when, when Reagan runs again. And I couldn't, I tried so hard to get Reagan to acknowledge that. I, I wrote my first book in that year, and I kept asking him about that. And finally, I think he got irritated by me asking him so many times, and he turns to me and he said, Lou, I'm not saying that I'm going to run for governor again. He said, but when is the next governor, when is the next election for governor? And he was telling me that the next election was three years away, and that he had gotten this tax increase through right away, and he knew damn well what he was doing, and I thought, I thought from that moment on, uh, nobody, not even Jess Unruh, who's the smartest, I think, legislator I ever met, uh, uh, could, uh, uh, was gonna stop him. Here you are a freshman Republican from San Diego. Uh, you're part of the uh, complete turnover in California politics in those days. I mean, Ronald Reagan swept in. Um, I mean, you won on your own merit, Pete, I know that. It was, it was, <laughs> you, you didn't have to hang on anyone's coattails. Uh, but, did you have a sense of who he was in terms of his, the skills that you were uh, going to see later, both in the governor's office and at the national level? Well, let me answer that by telling you <clears throat> that when he had been kind enough after leaving office to be the chairman, the honorary chairman of my campaign for governor, when I had won, he came out to the Van Nuys Airport I was going to fly up to Sacramento for my first trip after the election. And we'd arranged to have an availability for reporters, but we both got there early and we were sitting there having a cup of coffee. And he looked at me and he said, you know, knowing that I was going to be with you this morning, last night I couldn't help thinking about the difference between what you're going up 
to and, and what I'm going, or what I had to come up to. And he said, uh, and he said we're about the sa we were about the same age at the time that we got elected. But he said, what a difference in the experience. He said, I'd never held office. He said, you had been, uh, before you were elected governor, you had been the whip, the whip in the legislature, in the assembly. You'd been the mayor of San Diego. You'd been a U.S. senator for, for two, uh, for not full, two full terms, but for eight years. And he said, my God, that's a wealth of experience. And he said, I'd had none. And I started to laugh. And he said, what's so funny? I said, Mr. President, with all respect, experience is fine if it's been good experience or if you have learned something. But I said, what's far more important is that you went up to Sacramento and then went on to Washington knowing why it was that you had sought the office, knowing what you wanted to do with the power of the office. And you were quite consistent. And people respected that, and they learned early on that if they were going to buck you, it was going to be a fight. You might be willing to make some reasonable compromise. You'd give credit where it was due, but by God, you knew what you wanted to do. And you were going to do it. And he said, well, that's generous, Pete. I said, no, it's true. And he was a very good governor, and he got better as time went on. And he was one of the great presidents. I am convinced that history will treat him kindly. I know that Voltaire said that history is a trick we play on the dead. But uh, we have learned some things since he left office that make clear the uh, comment that, that was made that history will teach us new things and that when you leave office, you have an approval rating, but it may improve. Could get worse, too. But an, an example of that is the book <clears throat> that uh, Martin and Annalise Anderson have written called Reagan's Secret War. And about five years into the writing of this thing, or before he'd begun it, Marty Anderson said to me, this is going to be a terrific book because it's going to show that Reagan worked like a dog, that far from being passive, he was pushing the envelope on matters that were supposed to be beyond his kin. And he was talking about the, and then of course when he succeeded in getting declassified, the minutes of the National Security Council, uh, it made for a, a page turner of a book, and he was right, because it showed that Reagan was in fact pushing the professionals, the top military brass, because he was determined that he was going to bankrupt the Soviet Union, that he was going to put them in a position where he could not, or where they could not compete with him militarily. It was a two-track strategy, and he carried it out brilliantly. And in fact, I think uh, if you have read the book, you learned things. And if you haven't, I would urge people to do so, because it portrays the Ronald Reagan that I saw, and yet I learned things that I did not know, very important things. As far as his being governor, um, I saw him grow in the job. And he did have that wonderfully disarming ability to make fun of himself. I mean, he was an immensely likable guy, but I remember when he changed his mind about withholding. And he had said, my feet are in concrete on that. He opened the news conference, and before anyone could ask him a question, he said, that sound you hear is the cracking of the concrete around my feet. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, the the likability factor, uh, 
cannot be, I think, overstated, and it's always been important in American public life, but especially given the turmoil and the, and you have to remember that when Ronald Reagan first uh, appeared on the stage, uh, the culture in this country was being fractured in a lot of ways. Uh, we had the counterculture movement underway, the, the far left uh, had a big megaphone, uh, with Vietnam was going on. Um, and so likability for somebody with very strong, well-defined views like Ronald Reagan was very important to him. It would frustrate the hell out of his opponents, by the way, because they'd think they'd have him trapped with something he'd said and, you know, and people wouldn't respond to it. My very favorite uh, moment for his likability, however, was at the height of the Ronald Reagan first two years of his presidency. And we went through a very sharp recession at this stage in many states. We were still a double-digit uh, unemployment, you know, 12% in Ohio and, and, and more than 11% in Michigan. And so the White House, uh, uh, the president's advisor said, we've got to get you with some working class people. And they sent him up to South Boston, here into the uh, heart of uh, Tip O'Neill and Kennedy country. And he went to a pub, a working class pub. Pub was filled with unemployed workers who had lost their jobs in this recession. And the president disappeared into this pub, and the press was kept outside. And suddenly he appeared surrounded by cheering workers, and he was holding a big stein of beer, and he was toasting them. <laughs> and they were patting him on the back. And that's when you had one more demonstration of the magic touch of Ronald Reagan. Uh, Douglas Brinkley, you're a historian. You've written a lot about Theodore Roosevelt and other giants on the American stage. What did you learn about Ronald Reagan, especially when you began to edit his diaries, which incidentally I keep at my bedside in Montana because they're all so instructive, whatever the entry in many ways. Well, um, thank you, the Reagan Library, for having me here and, um, and also the USC. It's an incredible conference and happy birthday to Ronald Reagan, uh, which has brought us all here. Um, the, the main thing in the diaries, there's one thing he wrote as president and he said, uh, you know, people sometimes think I don't like FDR and the New Deal. I'm all about FDR and the New Deal. What I want to do is roll back the great society. And when you get into his biography and, and, and you realize um, what a person of the Midwest he is, Tampica, Illinois now, is getting uh, all geared up for this Sunday to celebrate Illinois' only president who was born there. Barack Obama moved to Chicago, Ulysses S. Grant has uh, spent some time there, and of course, famously, it's the land of Lincoln, but Lincoln came from Kentucky. So Ronald Reagan is Illinois' native son, and he always had a Western vector, Reagan, when he first moved across the Mississippi River to do radio at World of Chiropractor Radio in Davenport, Iowa. Um, he, would, he once stayed in a place where Buffalo Bill, he lodged where Buffalo Bill used to live, and he came out here to California, always looking west, not um, to the uh, east. He once famously said, you can never underestimate how far you can go if you look good on a horse in American politics, and, and he certainly did. But that growing up in the Great Depression and really understanding working people, and you know, there's a Ronald Reagan trail now for the centennial, Allen, Illinois, and you go like he lived at this house for this amount of time, and this one, and this one. Dixon is, of course, the main place. And the fact Eureka College, uh, all, how much he loved that, uh, particular college, that Midwest Ronald Reagan, the values of Main Street, Rotary Clubs, Fourth of July parades, uh, you know, people in the news media right now are interviewing uh, people that he saved as a lifeguard in the Rock River and all of that. It's a really quite a, um, a great American Midwest story, but I think the key is World War II for Ronald Reagan. I mean, he had bad eyesight and he couldn't serve uh, in Europe or the Pacific, but he became a captain in the Army Air Corps and made over 260 films for, um, for Army Air Corps, some on hygiene, some on, uh, you know, about from hygiene to nuclear fallout kind of um, um, films. And he became a spokesperson for the World War II during World War II. He was a cheerleader for it. And then, of course, in the 50s with General Electric, a spokesperson. And by the 60s, he became a spokesperson for the conservative movement. Um, in many ways. It was the first real guy modern conservatism, I think, had in the game. Uh, you had, you know, William Buckley and the National Review catching hold, but we talked, as, as Tom said, about the speech. 
at the Cow Palace in San Francisco in 64 and how seminal that was. But he had, he had well honed that speech down in the 50s by talking to GE workers. And it wasn't just the suits he was talking to. He would, he would do the speech in front of people uh, scattered across the country. He was an itinerant speaker, really, in the 50s. And I think that the, the speech is the seminal um, turning point in 64 because it got such a, a, he outshined Goldwater. And from that point on, uh, as Luke Cannon has documented so brilliantly, one of our you know, great, um, great writings he's done over the years on uh, Reagan, he became uh, California's native uh, son. And, uh, and this is the place that he loved, the West, the whole idea of the landscape of California. And, um, and also what I came across from the diaries is what a great love story your lunch partner, Nancy, how much Ronald Reagan and Nancy um, Reagan just absolutely loved each other and how indispensable she was as a partner in his life. If it's true, Tom, that I think it is that he was a very insular person and nobody got to penetrate that armor. Yes, Paul Laxalt was a friend. Yes, Bill Clark was a friend. But if he really kept that kind of inner reserve, the person who knew him the best was, was Nancy Reagan. And that comes across in the diaries. Uh, when I edited them, how often she would leave for like um, a two-day trip, and he'd be literally writing, I'm look, looking out the window for her return, and all the little notes that he, he wrote, and find, to her all the time, love notes. Finally, the diaries are remarkable because I think we underestimate Ronald Reagan as a writer. I had written an article for The New Yorker called Ronald Reagan's Pen Pal, some years back, and it was a woman who was ahead of his fan club in Philadelphia named Lorraine Wagner, and he had written over 200 letters to her, just you know, handwritten letters. When she told me she had them, I thought they had to be form letters, and they're not, and he really was quite a fine, I don't want to say he was an intellectual like Theodore Roosevelt or, or Thomas Jefferson, but he had a style, and it had a kind of Borscht Belt humor, um, hallmark sentiments, but also high moral purpose. And I think he was more well read in, in um, philosoph philosophy and economics, perhaps, than his critics had ever thought. And the fact of the matter is, as president, in an uh, era of, you know, we had Kennedy taped his White House, you know, tapes, Lyndon Johnson taped his White House conversations, Nixon famously did. Reagan didn't do the tapes. The great communicator didn't talk into the microphone because that's kind of, you, you, there, there's a more sense, a sense of losing control. He kept the, these big leather-bound books and wrote in them every day, every single day except when he was shot in the White House, um, I mean shot in Washington for about three days. So other presidents have kept a diary, but not consistently over an eight-year period. And um, I think more and more here at the library, they have these note cards where he'd keep his jokes and organize them. He's a much more um, self-organization, uh, self controlling his own game. And finally, he stayed above the fray. He was not thin-skinned. It wasn't just that he was the great dinner speaker, storyteller, but um, you couldn't really break that armor. You couldn't hurt him. He might have an outburst in the diary for a day, got it off his chest, but. Then he, he moved on, and so many presidents are thin-skinned. Reagan operated in a, in a realm of his own and never liked leaks, as no president does. But you would have a meeting, and people didn't know how Reagan sometimes felt in a cabinet meeting. Did he think this was policy idea was good? But he would then pull George Shultz aside and have a quiet word or talk to Nancy and then make a very firm decision. So I agree with this sort of new historical assessment that's happening of Reagan. He is a top-tier American president. Not sure where we're ranking him, but um, as a political leader, you know, we are living in the age of Ronald Reagan today. I mean, at, we lived in the shadow of FDR from 1932 to 1980, and, and Reagan was a revolution. And all presidents now are having to deal with the energy of Reagan, Clinton triangulation policies, and you're seeing a Democrat, Barack Obama now, um, trying to um, take a page from the Gipper here on this centennial. So he's, be, and he's become liked by the American people, not just as a president, but as a folklore figure. And I think when he was shot in March of 81, it helped bring a lot of people together, the jokes that he said there in Washington, and the fact that he kind of pulled, our, uh, pulled himself together
and, um, and developed a constituency for him, himself that was beyond the Republican Party at that time. He, uh, you know, he, he, people on the other side of the political spectrum, uh, all the way to the left in some cases, but people like Hillary Clinton, uh, looking at Ronald Reagan as a politician, said to me, he played the music beautifully. I didn't always agree with him, but I always thought that was a very apt phrase about Ronald Reagan, about how he presented himself and how people responded to it. Uh, Richard Reeves is one of America's distinguished political uh, journalists and also a great historian. He's written about John F. Kennedy and he's written uh, a wonderful book about um, Ronald Reagan as well. With my friend Lou, they're, they're both great friends of mine and these are the two great historians of Ronald Reagan. I wanna give you a slightly multi-part question, Richard. Um, a lot of people uh, now in, um, in, in the Republican Party, especially those who have very strong ideological views, invoke Ronald Reagan at every turn. Three times in the last two months, I've been uh, stopped by the likes of George Schultz, Jim Baker, and Roger Porter, who was on the economic policy team. And they have said to me, yes, he was a conservative, he had strong conservative views, but what they don't understand is how pragmatic he was. That he would say in a meeting, I would rather get 70% of this than go flying over the cliff with uh, the flags flying and get nothing. In your study of him, did you see an evolution of him from his conservative views? Uh, even if you were to take some of the public statements that he made, there seemed to be a certain rigidity about it, and which that then was more tempered as he went along, or was it always there? Well, it was always there. I, I wanted, I, it's a delight for me to, uh, to be back in this building, and I wanted to, it wasn't as big when I worked here, but on the other side of the building and underground are the archives of the National Archives of the Reagan presidency, as there are of all the other presidents, who modern presidents, who have libraries. And in addition to the, the bells and whistles and the wonderful things they have in this museum, I really would recommend to anyone uh, who comes to this museum or any presidential museum uh, to go into the archives and look at one thing. It's called the president's handwriting file. Everything that the president, this is what we do. Everything that the president has actually touched and signed and put ink or paper or, or lead or paper to it or written a note on it is all in the president's handwriting file. And suddenly they come out in boxes on the trolleys. You open it up and you touch history. You touch, in this building, you touch the same piece of paper, the same notes that Ronald Reagan made to himself every morning as he spent time on the telephone talking to congressional leaders. And if he got them to go along with them, particularly if they were Democrats, would write at the bottom, mission impossible. It's hard to describe the thrill that you are there uh, with him. You are, you are seeing and feeling uh, history. I think that, uh, it's a funny way to put it, one of the things that made Ronald Reagan great at being president, and I would say there's a difference between being great at president, being great at being president, and being a great president. The great president part of it, the legacy, uh, is still being decided. That's an ongoing uh, battle that will go on uh, through history, and people will sit here 50 years uh, from now and talk about that. However, when Tom asked, did he change? Ronald Reagan was an old man. He was a stubborn old man. He knew what he thought. He couldn't get his mind changed about other things. He didn't much, the trilogy I did on the presidency included two desperately ambitious young men John Kennedy and Richard Nixon, who cared above all about what other people were saying about them, about what other people thought of them, about what history would think of them. Ronald Reagan was old enough 
really not to give a damn about what uh, <laughs> people said about him. He was going to do what he was going to do. It was going to work or it wasn't. In 1985, uh, his political counselor, uh, a, a man named Ed Rollins, mentioned to him something over an issue uh, that, and brought up the word legacy, your legacy as president, what history will say. And Reagan cut him off. And he said, Ed, first of all, history probably will get it distorted when it's written. And anyway, I won't be around to read it. <laughs> uh, but we are around uh, to live it. And the, uh, the role, the legacy of Ronald Reagan, as Doug Brinkley said, frankly, Reagan is still president, uh, as, as Franklin Roosevelt was president for 30 years. They were the great oaks. When, when Richard Nixon became president, uh, he suddenly, we suddenly found him saying, he, he, aren't we all Keynesians now? Because actually the Nixon presidency was rather liberal because it was an extension of the, uh, of the Roosevelt presidency. The Obama presidency, which we are seeing now, uh, is not only conservative because, or somewhat conservative, some uh, because of, uh, of what Obama thinks. It is because Reagan's influence is still so powerful uh, on the, the country. Whatever you think of him, whether you uh, approve of him or disapprove of him, he was great at being president. He knew how to be president. He's, his favorite presidential biography, biographers obviously have a great deal to do with what we think of presidents. Uh, David McCullough writes Truman. That changes what history thinks of Truman. Hey, after all, Pastor Weems uh, did it for George Washington. Why shouldn't we be able to do it for Ronald Reagan, even those of us who disagreed with him politically, but understood he was a great leader, even if we didn't want to go in the exact uh, direction uh, that he was going. His favorite presidential biography was a little known, uh, auto, the autobiography of Calvin Coolidge. He read it when he was 13 years old, read it again in the White House twice. He underlined in that, uh, in that book a quote by uh, uh, Calvin Coolidge, and this is what a Silent Cal said. In the discharge of the duties of the office, there is one role of action more important than all others. It consists of never doing anything someone else can do for you. That's the difference between Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter. Uh, it is, presidents are judged on one or two or three or four big things that they do, usually unexpected. It's a reactive job. We didn't know, a uh, president doesn't know that Egypt is suddenly going to blow up in his face, nor does he know that oil wells in the Gulf of Mexico uh, are going to blow up, yet he is going to be judged uh, by how he deals with those three or four things. Uh, nobody remembers whether Abraham Lincoln balanced the budget, uh, and no one is going to remember uh, things like that about Obama or about Reagan. What Reagan did, uh, he was a great, great politician. And there, there are two things that I, I'll say about him and then stop. One is that when you read through the General Electric years and his own life experience, the one thing that has been mentioned here is his reaction to the 93% marginal tax rate on money after you earned a certain amount of money. And one day, Ronald Reagan, one year, Ronald Reagan earned that much money and found out he was going to get 7% of it and the government was going to get 93% uh, uh, of it. He, uh, the Roosevelt, it, it, early populism in America, the populism that came out of the Midwest, which people there knew they were getting the short end of the stick in some way. Was it Wall Street, the railroads, New York? Uh, somebody was screwing them. 
uh, and big business was the enemy. Ronald Reagan changed American politics in our lifetimes, perhaps forever, by reversing populism and making big government the enemy. Big government is the cause of your problems. It's not the solution. And that is the, uh, that's the, the America we're living in today. The majority opinion in America thinks that the government inherently uh, is bad for them as they once believed uh, big business was. That is an incredible uh, political achievement. The other way that we will live with, I think, for our whole lives with Ronald Reagan has to do with what the Republican Party became and was at the time he was elected president. It was a party that was trying to include Wall Street bankers and Jerry Falwell. It, you had religious conservatives, social conservatives, traditional uh, physical conservatives, uh, you had some crazy folks, you had libertarians, and they were spinning in orbit like uh, the electrons of an atom. And most of them hated each other. Uh, and most of them still exist today, as we know. And what held them together was the nucleus of Ronald Reagan, the one thing they could all agree on in 1976, 1980, and in 2010, and probably in 2012. The Tea Party, uh, the Wall Streeters, the religious conservatives, the social conservatives, the gun people, the libertarians, where else can they turn? The party has no other center than the electromagnetism of Ronald Reagan. That's why his legacy is not only important in terms of history, I, I would consider, frankly, that he would, is near the top of the second tier of American presidents, not, uh, uh, not in the same class with Lincoln, FDR, and Washington, but pretty high up because of the changes uh, that he was able to, to make, uh, including keeping alive uh, American conservatism, which is pretty good at, at eating its uh, young. Uh, Richard, uh, so that's, that's why it's so important why we have the Reagan Legacy Project, many people here are involved with it, came along when the New York Times, in what I don't consider wisdom, had Arthur Schlesinger Jr. do one of their surveys of historians and of presidents. I, uh, I, I refuse to fill those out because I always get to Martin Van Buren and I want to confess to this audience, I don't know a damn thing about Martin Van Buren. <laughs> so how can I say where he fits as a president? But in, uh, eight years after he was out of office, the New York Times did a survey like that and Ronald Reagan came in 35th, just behind Rutherford B. Hayes. Uh, and we all know what Rutherford B. Hayes uh, did for the country. At that point, the conservative movement, led at first by Grover Norquist, uh, began the Reagan legacy policy, realizing that American conservatism could not hold itself together and remain under our election laws, where we, you have to have uh, two parties, unless Ronald Reagan was considered Mount Rushmore uh, material. And that's what a lot of this effort's about. And so far, I think it's succeeded quite well. Uh, uh, thank you, Richard. Now, I'd like to do a kind of a rapid round here so we can, we now know what the overarching positions are uh, of our guests here. Let me begin with you, Lou Cannon. Uh, there was uh, some reference, as Richard just made, to his stubbornness. Uh, Iran Contra almost uh, unraveled the presidency because he was, he had a hard time dealing with that. Uh, he did. Uh, and uh, one person whose name has not been mentioned up here enough is Nancy Reagan's. Nancy Reagan, more than anybody, got him to deal with it. And it's very interesting what happened after he made that speech, uh, saying my hearts and minds um, uh, about sending arms to the 
Iran tell me one thing, the facts tell me another, his, his ratings, which had been very low during that period, bounced right back up, which said to me that the American people wanted to believe Ronald Reagan. But I just, I want to take, if this is a wraparound, I, I did, I, we've all been so nice to each other. I disagree with uh, my friend uh, Dick Reeves. I think Reagan was good at being, uh, great at being president, but I think he was a great president, too. And I think he was a great president. I, I don't think he was a great president because, because he uh, saved American conservatism or the provided a rallying point for the Republican Party. All, of, all those things are true. He lowered the marginal tax rate from 70 to 28 percent. Well, we may not remember that he didn't balance the budget, but a lot of people remember that. But I think he's a great president because of what he did with, with the Soviet Union, with Mikhail Gorbachev. The notion that we could destroy civilization as we know it was not a metaphor, it was true. And Ronald Reagan had a plan. He came to the Washington Post in June of 1980. He had secured the nomination, but he hadn't been nominated yet. And he says, he's talking about building up the military, and this is one of these groups of editors and reporters, and people asked a lot of questions. And one of the questions is, if you do this, aren't we going to have a more intense arms race? And Ronald Reagan said, in effect, yes, but it's good because the Soviets will come to the bargaining table. And Ronald Reagan told me that I'd ask him what he learned in negotiating. He said the purpose of a negotiation is to get an agreement. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't, he wanted a bargain with the Soviet Union from a position of strength. He was fortunate, we were fortunate, the world was fortunate that Mikhail Gorbachev came along after the succession of geriatric Soviet leaders so that there was somebody to bargain with. But Ronald Reagan was always ready to bargain. He's writing a letter to Brezhnev when he's recovering from his wounds and these over the objection of his Secretary of State, Al Haig. I don't think it's an accident that the nuclear arsenals were much reduced, that the world was a safer place, and I think that, that that's what's going to be remembered about Ronald Reagan. That is not a conservative achievement. It's a radical achievement. He did not believe in mutual assured destruction, which was the accepted policy of the left and the right in this country uh, and, and in the Soviet Union, too. So I think, I think he, his greatness is, is established, even though we are obviously going to debate his ranking uh, uh, forever. We're still debating Washington's ranking. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, Governor Wilson, I talked I about this. Um, I was, the, uh, I'm going to let you come back to this, Richard. Go ahead. I'm going to let you come back to this. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, I, I mentioned this on Meet the Press recently. Um, uh, president Reagan cut the taxes in the first two years, and then they had a shortfall when he was president, and they had to increase taxes. Yep. It was a <clears throat> significant tax increase, one of the largest uh, in recent times. I know, I was running for the Senate then. <laughs> <laughs> he had this great line. He said, it's an extension of the tax cut that we had the last time. And it's really enhanced revenue that we're talking about here, not a tax increase. Were you sometimes astonished at what he could get away with in terms of his explanation? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was. <laughs> but I, I'll tell you something about that too, because here, I am running for the Senate from his home state and publicly disagreed with him about the tax increase, which made me less than popular with the staff. I remember that. <laughs> and I, when asked why, I said, I think he is acting responsibly, but he's acting on a premise that has been put to him Tip O'Neill has said, Mr. President, if you do that, if you go along with this tax increase, we will cut $3 for every dollar of tax increase. I said, I don't believe him. They'll welch on it. You'll do your thing. You'll keep the bargain, and they won't. And that's what happened. And he later said, yeah, you were right. I was wrong. But I, I've got to say, he... Uh, he was a man of principle, and yes, he was stubborn. Uh, Richard is right. But he was stubborn 
about principle, and he was also stubborn about what he knew to be his leverage. In the Reykjavik meeting, as we have now all read, went through an afternoon in which Gorbachev seemed to be making magnificent concessions. Until late in the afternoon, when he said through his interpreter, Mr. President, you do understand that everything that we have discussed, all the concessions that I have agreed to, are contingent upon your abandonment of the Strategic Defense Initiative. At which point, he slammed his notebook shut, turned to George Schultz and said, come on, George, we're out of here. And if there is a photograph, they talk about being worth a thousand words, the most eloquent photograph, I think, I have ever seen of public figures having a disagreement as they were leaving the meeting house. It was cold as hell. It was Iceland, and it was January. And they're all bundled up. And Gorbachev is about a step above him. He's, I think, walking downstairs. But in any case, he is pitching Reagan big time, <laughs> right into his ear and looking agitated. And Reagan, nice man, but he had a temper. Didn't see it often, but when you saw it, it was real. And Reagan is having none of it, absolutely none of it. And nine months later, at the Brandenburg Gate, he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. I think that got his attention. And Gorbachev does deserve credit. But the guy that made him come to the table was Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan didn't know how to negotiate. And when he said, George, we're out of here, it wasn't just temper. It was because he knew that that was something he could not give up. It would be giving up all the leverage that you had. And he then proceeded to fully implement both the economic track undermining their economy by depressing the price of oil, upon which they had relied to gloss over the failures of communism. This was a, a tough guy, and he knew how to bargain. And he also, uh, another example is when he vetoed the defense authorization bill into which the House Democrats had inserted all of these things that, number one, usurped his authority, and number two, made no military sense. Again, it's about SDI and about nuclear weapons. And that provoked a hell of a fight among the Republicans in the Senate. Doug Brinkley, uh, there were some issues in which the president was not, and uh, it was surprisingly, if not insensitive, uh, uh, was not as aware as you would expect him to be. I always thought he was on race. He was more a product of his generation. Race had moved on, in a way, with the civil rights movement. He was slower in catching up to that, in a way. And when we first had the AIDS epidemic in America, he had a very hard time coming to grips with that. Did you get any insight into why, in looking at the diaries and studying him as a man? Well, um, Ronald Reagan was a man without any personal prejudice when he grew up in Illinois. Um, you know, we, we don't have time for his whole biography, but dealing with the football team when he played, he wouldn't, you know, he always wanted things integrated. So Ronald Reagan, was a true integrationist. He never bought into segregationist sloganeering. Um, somebody who signed Martin Luther King Day into law. Uh, he did not like what liberal um, movement people in the diaries like Jesse Jackson, he could not, uh, did not care for at all, thought he was grandstanding all the time. I think the, his slow response to the um, AIDS uh, epidemics, one of the lower marks in his um, in history. He didn't really uh, put it front and center and talk about it away. And he didn't like Bishop Tutu in South Africa very much. Uh, Reagan was a product, as you said perfectly, Tom, I think of that first Cold War generation um, and, and of the World War II. And I think that it's about the liberation of Europe. Well, we won World War II in Europe. We liberated half of it. But we had a second half of Europe to liberate, Poland and Czechoslovakia. And the fact that Europe, the cradle of Western civilization, half of it was living under totalitarianism, goaded him. 
and uh, it fueled his thinking in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, right up to what Pete Wilson is saying there at Gorbachev, that you didn't have uh, any freedom or any rights in, in the Soviet Union. You couldn't read a Bible. You couldn't, uh, you know, um, talk freely. There was no freedom of the press. And it really uh, angered him. And his accomplishment, as Luke Cannon said, I think in the end, history is saying this is, as Margaret Thatcher said, Reagan won the Cold War without firing the single shot. Well, shots were fired in Libya or Grenada, but you get the idea of it. And, and if I just could add one other thing, uh, Vice President George Herbert Walker Bush sometimes, was, you were there in Berlin, but I mean the Berlin Wall went down on Bush and uh, the Soviet Union broke up during President Bush. And we're gonna have to look at the Bush legacy in, in the Cold War too, because he was a great VP and um, constantly worked with Ronald Reagan. They were, were quite a team. But I, there was no prejudice in Reagan as a person. Any, uh, in fact, he had abhorred people that had any kind of personal uh, racism, even though his policy sometimes didn't make that as clear as it should have. I want to ask the two of you, uh, and then we're going to get to the whole legacy as we wrap up here, but I want to ask you about a couple of, uh, very briefly, a couple of specific political incidents and, and one a national security issue that could have sent the, the Reagan presidential aspirations the other way and uh, the Reagan presidency the other way. If in Detroit, Lou, he had taken Gerald Ford as the vice president with all the conditions that were attached, do you think that the country would have elected him that fall? I don't, I don't think he ever could have taken Gerald Ford. I, I thought that was a non-starter. I was writing all week it was going to be, be Bush and, and, and uh, uh, but why thank did they God Ben Bradley was there because I wouldn't have been able to get away with writing it. He was my editor. But that whole, what happened was this. The contingent passions of the entourage took over in that debate. It seemed so fascinating, this idea that you'd have this experience. And so you've got, uh, uh, you know, Alan Greenspan and, and, uh, yeah, Kissinger. and Kissinger, and you've got all these people, and they're not, but it, 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 it was, it was, it was bound to explode. You remember see, when Reagan sees, I think it was with Barbara Walters, uh, that uh, uh, she, Ford is talking about a division of powers, and Reagan was decided right then and there, uh-uh, you know, it isn't, it isn't, we, we can't, I mean, there was just no way for that to have happened. And I don't think it, it, it was, I don't think he could have left, I don't think he could have left Detroit with, with with Ford as his vice president, I just I think it was, it was a it was a, a goofy idea from the start. Uh, Richard, um, uh, one of the uh, tragic episodes of uh, Ronald Reagan's presidency, the loss of uh, more than 300 Marines in Lebanon, um, and he had sent them there, and they had uh, very tempered, to put it politely, rules of engagement. Uh, they didn't have lock and loaded weapons, and and. Uh, uh, and I always thought that that would have been a much deeper hole for him for a longer period of time had it not been for the Challenger explosion, which came, what, 10 days later or two weeks later yeah. after that, in which he healed the country with that remacable speech that he made about uh, the frontiers of space That's and the, the loss of these of astronauts. I uh, think that... Uh, the Lebanon incident, the killing of the Marines in the first truck bombing of what began the new era, was extraordinarily revealing about Ronald Reagan, the pragmatist. Uh, we had made a terrible mistake. Uh, the national security people and the Marine Corps had made a terrible mistake putting, uh, when multinational forces were trying to uh, hold the peace in Lebanon, uh, and the American assignment was the airport. Well, the airport was the lowest part of the city and it was surrounded by Shiite slum neighborhoods. And though we were welcomed there at first, although not by the Israelis, the Israelis were against this deal and they had been holding the airport. And when the American Marines arrived, there were feces and urine in all the drawers and on top of all the deaths left, but left by the Israelis. But at first, the Americans were welcomed, as we usually are at first. Uh, but then, more and more, the Shiites, the poor Muslims living around them, came to 
hate the kind of arrogance, the kind of city on a hill. Ronald Reagan may have gone over the top on city on the hill that his American exceptionalism was that Americans were better than other people. People in uh, Beirut didn't necessarily believe that, and certainly the poor people there did. They kill all our Marines, and they also kill 150 French men at the same moment with another bomb. Uh, Ronald Reagan gives a speech about what a terrible thing this is, and it was, uh, and, and how unfair and how wrong it was, and then he cut and ran. He pulled, he announced, we'll redeploy the Marines. Well, we did redeploy the Marines. Uh, we redeployed them on ships, and they went home. That's a pragmatic political leader, which some of his successors should have learned a great uh, lesson from. So no, I don't think it was the challenger. I think it was his own sensibility in realizing this situation is impossible. We're out of here. Can I add one note to that? When I, I, anybody who's read my books know that I'm very critical of Reagan on Lebanon. I think that's the low point of his presidency, not Iran-Contra. Ronald Reagan was haunted by what happened to those Marines. When I interviewed him years later, he said, this was the saddest day of my presidency, the saddest day of my life. I think that the death of those Marines really bothered him. And I think that, that you know, in a long presidency that was successful in most respects, that was not successful. And, and the individual tragedy of that really, really bothered him. But he stopped him. it from being much worse. Richard is exactly right. Uh, we, we were out, we were redeployed and uh, uh, by February, I think we were, uh, February of 84, we were out of, out of, out of Lebanon. I just, uh, one other uh, observation about this. There are some who believe that that was a signal uh, to the uh, radical uh, Muslims and others that the United States will cut and leave. Uh, and that was the beginning of a long tale of terror. Also the end of a long tale. Yeah. Where our troops left uh, on the same beach that the Crusaders left, right. when the last Crusaders yeah. Uh, left the Middle East hundreds of years and uh, we're, before. We're watching what's going on today. So I'm going to ask you to wrap up, and because these, uh, this audience has been so, so patient with us, um, to each of you in your own way, and in just a few sentences, tell us what you think 50 years from now, historians and other observers of the American political scene will see uh, as the legacy of Ronald Reagan. Uh, the single defining moment or issue that defined his presidency. Doug, you're the historian. Let's begin with you. Well, in 1979, you had uh, the Soviet Union invading Afghanistan. We had um, the Iran hostage crisis. You had double-digit inflation, long gasoline lines, and a Carter administration in, in, in doldrums. We are a country kind of exhausted from the 1960s Vietnam War problems, Watergate, and Reagan came in in 81 and kind of restored a confidence in the United States and took a kind of a, a firm approach to the Soviet Union, the trust but verify line that will live on sort of forever, the old uh, you know proverb, but um, was able to get the result of the Gorbachev diplomacy. Uh, the fact that he worked closely with Pope John Paul II of Poland and the Vatican in this second thrust of defeating communism because in its own way the Soviet Union, the Kremlin was as reprehensible as, um, as Hitler or Stalin was. And many people had got become myopic about that. We kind of were living within the Cold War, two scorpions in a bottle as the metaphor came. Reagan kind of shattered that and said we could win the Cold War and the United States did. Well, I would agree, and I would say that uh, the earlier comments about that, that you made, uh, Tom, in your remarks about his totally rejecting the idea of mutually assured destruction as something that was not only morally reprehensible, but from a pragmatic standpoint, damn dangerous. I mean, it's almost it, a certain amount of time went by without an incident, but the question is, do you want this to be an enduring tension that one day can lead to the annihilation of maybe two nations and maybe more? The point is, he, for the, all the reasons that 
Doug just cited, um, I think was very good at being the president, but I would have to say I think he will, deserves to go down in history as a great president because he fashioned, uh, as none of his predecessors had, a strategy that he made work. It was a two-track strategy. He forced down the price of oil by getting the Saudis to do it. He also made it clear to Gorbachev that he could not win an arms race, couldn't win a competition, and not only prevented World War III from happening, but I think has made the world much safer uh, in terms of nuclear threats, although at that point we had two superpowers. We had, if a ruthless and irrational trigger, or not an, a rational trigger, a, a finger on the trigger, and uh, today that's a serious question. Uh, well, you've weighed in on his legacy on, um, on uh, and facing down the Soviet Union. Are there other parts of his legacy that 50 years from now, do you think will uh, kind of leap off the pages for historians who are studying his presidency? Well, um, a lot of what's going to leap off the pages is, you know, and everybody knows is going to depend on, on what, you know, happens next. If we had a nuclear war, that legacy wouldn't be there. But I think the other part of the legacy that I, Ronald Reagan said, he, he, the interesting thing about Ronald Reagan keeps telling you what he wants to do and what, he, and what, he, and what he's going to do. And uh, people didn't pay a lot of attention to it sometimes. But Ronald Reagan said when he, that what he wanted to do, he says this in his memoirs at the end of the, is to make the American people believe in themselves again. Uh, Walter Lippmann famously said that the greatness of de Gaulle wasn't that he was in France, but that France was in de Gaulle. And the greatness of Reagan <coughs> was that America was inside of him. And he reflected back to us an America that we cared about and believed in. And I think that resonates today. I hope it resonates 50 years from now because it was an important part of the Reagan presidency and an important part of the way, the f affection and gratitude that so many of us feel for Ronald Reagan. Richard? I think that uh, he deserves uh, the credit for ending the Cold War, not winning it, but ending it. After all, it was won beginning with Harry Truman by hundreds of millions of Americans. But that he and I had a correspondence because there was something we were agreed on uh, a great deal. I, in 1970, early 75, I wrote a piece after doing a book tour and hearing for the first time late night radio and people talking about the government in Washington. Uh, I wrote a piece saying that the next president of the United States would either be Jimmy Carter, who was Annie Washington, or Ronald Reagan, who was anti government. And Reagan sent me a note at that time about that and about other times we had met. And we talked then and wrote then about something that I always admired enormously Ronald Reagan uh, for something that uh, I had uh, spent time in the Soviet Union and worked there. And like many other people, the first day I saw the place. I knew these people were not going to beat us at anything, ever. <laughs> uh, it was a pathetic pile of junk with lethargic, unhappy people. Ronald Reagan had come to that same conclusion without ever having been there, that it was an he had an intellectual view that communism could not sustain himself. He stuck to that view, got lucky with uh, Gorbachev, and was, a and, re and was able, and remember, there are probably people in this room. That last year and a half of the Reagan presidency, when he was making nice with Gorbachev and vice versa, much of his own party, even his own staff, uh, thought he was making a fool of himself and wanted to stop. And I think he deserves, again, I would call it the stubborn old man syndrome, deserves tremendous credit for that. Didn't win the Cold War. We won the Cold War. But he brought it to an end. I think there's one uh, subject that's out in terms of his legacy, which they may be debating still in 50 years. 
And that is the view of how the American economy should work, where taxation, regulation, and the rest fits in. Someone could easily conclude that Ronald Reagan made a reputation by attacking tax and spend Republican, uh, Democrats and then creating borrow and spend Republicans, which we had in office certainly through, uh, through the Bush years. I think that subject may still be open depending on how the American economy works 50 years from now. I want to th uh, thank our panelists all very much and leave you with just uh, one more observation. We've talked a lot about Ronald Reagan's humanity and his uh, self-deferential humor and how well it served him even in the most difficult times. One of my very favorite stories about him was the morning of his inauguration as President of the United States. They were staying at Blair House. Uh, Nancy was up early, dressed and ready to go. Mike Deaver said, where's the president-elect? And she said, I think he's still in the bedroom asleep. <laughs> and Mike Deaver opened the door and said, Governor, it's time for us to go. You're going to be inaugurated as president of the United States today. It's time to get up. And from beneath the covers, he heard the new president of the United States say plaintively, do I have to? <laughs> Thank you all very much. Uh, I especially want to thank them for sharing their memories as well as their expertise, which has given us really a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that we wouldn't have otherwise. And because Ronald Reagan's uh, legacy is still being shaped, and this event and the events to come over the next uh, several weeks will help shape that legacy, we are also uh, involved in history in the making uh, while we are here today. For those of you who couldn't uh, attend the uh, rest of the uh, symposia at USC, uh, it will be on our website shortly. Uh, we videotaped it. Uh, we also, there will be four or five papers that will be produced out of it that we will be making it available as well. So uh, again, uh, thank you all for coming.